Hi, David. Thank you very much for uh, um, uh, your words. It's very kind, much appreciated. Uh, and Anna as well, thank you very much. Um, I hope um, this will be a uh, fun presentation uh, and a bit of a, a personal look at, at the world of robots. Hi, Rowena, much appreciated. Thank you very much for coming. If you do have any comments or chat, please do put it into the um, sidebar and um, I will try and answer your questions uh, at the end, if that's okay. Welcome from Dublin, Andrea, much appreciated. Okay. So um, I'd like to kick off now. Um, my name is uh, Ben Scott Robinson, and I am co-founder and CEO of The Small Robot Company. Uh, and we have a mission uh, to uh, help farmers to uh, improve their yields and their profits while regenerating the planet at the same time uh, and using three small robots to make that happen. So I wanted to tell you a story, I suppose, about how all this came about. Uh, and uh, a bit of an introduction to the thought processes that lead to, uh, lead, led to Sam and I deciding to uh, start trying to make robots and, and change the world of arable farming. And the story starts with uh, a near car crash, I suppose you could say. Uh, so I have been working in uh, user experience design and service design, taking some of the uh, most advanced technologies uh, and creating products that people love, uh, either as uh, startups or as agencies, uh, for the last uh, 20 years, more than 20 years. Uh, and this has um, allowed me to see that sometimes technology has the capacity to be able to bring transformational change. So a few years ago, I was lucky enough to be working at Britain's National Mapping Agency, Ordnance Survey, uh, as their uh, head of experience and dealing with some uh, pretty big data geospatial problems and creating uh, things that allow people to use that geospatial big data in an interesting way. Uh, but one day I was driving to work uh, very early, uh, about 5.45 in the morning, uh, and uh, I was half asleep. And as I'm sure um, anybody who's crazy enough to be at that time will know, uh, on Radio 4, um, as I was driving in, was farming today. And uh, I didn't really have any interest uh, in uh, the subjects that were going on. Uh, I don't really know, didn't really know an awful lot about farming, apart from growing up in Norfolk. Um, but uh, I found this particular session absolutely fascinating. It was because uh, the uh, programme was entirely dedicated to a review of the Oxford Farming Conference. Now, the Oxford Farming Conference is where the great and the good of farming uh, get together and discuss uh, the future, discuss what's happening and discuss uh, how farming uh, can better serve uh, the British people um, and uh, better produce food. And you have some fantastic people there. You have um, senior people from all the major agricultural companies, the, the big farmers, a range of uh, all sorts of interests and, and uh, very clever people talking about uh, exciting new inventions uh, and government as well. Um, so this is the place where the agriculture minister will be uh, talking about uh, his view for the government and farming moving forward. This particular Oxford Farming Conference was looking at the future of farming. Uh, and it was vaguely interesting because I was listening to a large agricultural company talking about the future of arable farming as they saw it. And the way they laid it out was that farming as this industrial process um, was one uh, that could be improved through incremental change. So, and that incremental change uh, was primarily driven by the use of uh, bigger and faster machinery. Uh, some of it, like this tractor here, uh, was autonomous, so didn't require any drivers. Um, but ultimately, it was about shoving the seed in the ground faster, plowing deeper and faster. It was about um, making everything as efficient as possible and creating an ever more streamlined industrial process that is farming uh, by the third agricultural revolution. But then the next person to, to speak um, was a professor from Harper Adams University, who have a room here today, um, Professor Simon Blackmore. And he started talking about a future that looked very, very different. So whereas the previous uh, speaker was talking about efficiency and speed and what was essentially industrial processes, 
Um, Professor Simon countered that by saying that farming shouldn't be an industrial process. Ultimately, we're growing plants. And despite centuries of trying to make everything standard and the same, plants are all different. Uh, and the way that plants interact with the soil and their environment is all different. So that we should be considering farming in a completely different way, in a way that is more precise uh, and more accurate, uh, and in a way that maybe has less um, impact uh, on the land. Maybe the vehicles are lighter. Um, maybe the system needs to use a, a very a different way of delivering farming. So this absolutely knocked me off my seat because then he started to talk about the idea of using autonomous vehicles and AI to be able to drive this forward. Uh, and he started talking about the idea of using uh, an understanding of the crop that was much more detailed and much more precise and being in able to enact on that information, not just collecting it once, but collecting it multiple times, not just um, uh, applying uh, information gathered on a field by field basis, but on a much smaller area, maybe on a meter by meter basis, or maybe even smaller than that. And this was the point or I nearly crashed the car. This was such a massive change in thinking, an epochal shift uh, from the way that farming had been addressed before, that it really made me stay up and pay attention. So in Professor Simon's studious tones, I saw the future, not just the future of arable farming, not just the future that applies to a tiny proportion of the British or worldwide population, but the future of how we eat, the future of food ultimately. What do I mean, future of food? So, you know, surely we eat now. You know, we are in a situation where more people are getting more food than they ever did before. Huge proportions of the world are, are, are becoming uh, more capable of eating a more varied diet than they were before. Globalization has led to uh, food being transported around the world and delivered uh, so that people can get uh, beans fresh all through the year. Isn't this fantastic situation and while there are still people in food poverty that number has shrunk massively in the last 40 or 50 years so surely the future of food could just be the same as the current um, situation with food well to understand this a bit better i think we need to understand uh, what the third agricultural revolution was so um, this is actually a picture um, from uh, my business partner sam's farm um, way back at the end of the First World War, when, um, because they had sold their horses um, to the army to be used uh, in the trenches, um, the, with the money that they got back, they received, or they had the chance to be able to buy a newfangled piece of equipment called a tractor. And although Sam's family were very early in doing this, this tractor, particularly after the end of the Second World War and driven by the requirements, certainly in the UK, of having to provide a lot more food for a growing population, led to what was called the Green Revolution. So at the start or the end of the Second World War, at the start of the Green Revolution, um, farms were producing, on average, two tonnes of wheat per hectare. And they were using small vehicles, probably like this, maybe still horses, uh, in small fields, um, and they were um, uh, doing a lot of manual labor with a lot of people on the land. By the end of that, by the end of that process in the 90s, farms were able to produce eight tons of wheat per hectare by using much bigger machinery, much um, faster uh, and uh, deeper plows, uh, by using much more chemicals and chemical fertilizer, and by ripping out the hedgerows and making the fields much bigger. Farming became an industrial process and farming became an industrial process primarily in the Western world. So in Europe, in America, in Australia, all these benefits were able to be applied so that the food production there could massively increase. But for a large proportion of the world and for hundreds of millions of farmers, this technology was simply not available. You know, if you are a farmer in India and your farm size is not tens or hundreds of hectares or even thousands of hectares, but one hectare, then there is no economy of scale of buying a tractor or using big machinery. So all this started to taper off around about 1990. And at this point, the amount of the increase of yields uh, that were available started to flatline. There are ups and downs, and any farmer will tell you that 
um, the the vast majority of um, uh, the benefits of a, of a yield or of a crop in a particular year uh, are often driven by weather. And we've seen that certainly quite recently. But ultimately, the trend line for the production of wheat, and we use wheat as the example here, stopped increasing in 1990. But the cost of vehicles kept on increasing. And the demand for the increase in yields kept driving uh, the big um, farming uh, machinery manufacturers to be able to produce ever bigger vehicles, to be ever more efficient, to try and drive out incremental change. But in this process of doing that, then and applying the industrial scale thinking, which these companies are most capable in supporting, uh, they started to produce some serious results. And those results are not particularly good. In the UK, we suffer from soil compaction. And that's where great big tractors drive across the land and compress the soil into a hard concrete-like substance. And that reduces the income from fields by about one billion pounds a year. On top of that, by turning over the topsoil when you plow, uh, you release all the carbon and nitrogen and the nutrients up into the air, which is not only bad for uh, climate change, it also denudes the soil of the fuel that the plants need to be able to grow. And this releasing this soil to be washed away by the wind or the rain causes 2.2 million tonnes of soil to be lost in the UK alone, just washed into the river or lost into the air. And it is having an ongoing and increasing effect globally. So intensive farming of the system that I've been talking about means that um, a lot of farms will be infertile in 40 years or less. Some are already feeling that. Dust bowl situations are already starting to happen in the Midwest of the US, as they did back in the 1920s. And so we are losing massive amounts of topsoil. And ultimately, by 2050, with the increase of population and the reduction in usable um, uh, fields, it means that there will be 75% less productive land. But what can farmers do about it? They're stuck in this cycle. They have heavy machinery, but that heavy machinery causes this massive damage. And that damage needs uh, to be uh, countered. And the way that farmers counter, counter it is by using cultivation, is by using plows to be able to turn the soil over, to try and release new nutrients, to be able to create a, a good environment to put the seeds into. But by doing that, you're degrading the soil and you're losing the soil, as I was saying before. So to try and counter that, farmers have to use chemicals, whether that's chemical fertilizer or because of the breakdown of the biome, because the soil has been churned up so much, chemical pesticides and nutrient, um, pest pesticides, fungicides and herbicides. And those chemicals are all really expensive. So they increase the cost of production, which means that farmers uh, have to reduce their costs of uh, production uh, to counter for that by trying to be more efficient. And that mindset leads to ever heavy machinery and you're back to the start again. And this loop is just endless. So what is needed is a complete change of thinking, a complete change of thinking that Professor Simon heralded on his talk at the Oxford Farming Conference those years ago. Instead of thinking about farming as an industrial process, where you use heavyweight machinery and high cultivation, uh, and you just view uh, your farm at a field level and apply chemicals and nutrients to that field as if it was one um, data point, uh, you need to start thinking about using lightweight vehicles, about minimum cultivation, trying to leave less of an impact on the soil so you don't need to plant. You not need to start thinking not on a per field, uh, field level, but on a per plant level and having precision treatment um, that only treats the plants that need it or only kills individual weeds. This allows you to be nutrient neutral because you're allowing the soil to regenerate and ultimately it's sustainable. So back to that car crash. Well, um, this uh, talk completely blew me away. So as soon as I got into work, uh, I emailed uh, Professor Blackmore because I realized that this was the direction that my life needed to go in. And by lunchtime, I had a call with him and we had established a good relationship and understanding how farms uh, could be changed through robotics from a technical perspective. But things didn't really start to move forward to me until uh, Simon introduced me to Sam. Now, Sam, was a, or is an arable farmer who lives just down the road from Harper Adams University. And he had come back from working at Accenture um, to inherit his family farm. But when he started looking at the books, he realized that the advantages um, of the third agricultural revolution, the increases in yield, which should go year by year had actually flatlined. And actually his farm was starting to go out of business. 
So when we started talking to it, he could see firsthand the issues that needed to be resolved. And he had a strong farmer's view on why these uh, problems weren't being resolved and uh, how we could start to move forward. But with my background in service and user experience design, um, we worked out that the first thing that we needed to do was to sit down and actually speak to the farmers. So Sam went out on the road for six months. He went to talk to 50 farmers and spend a long time in understanding them. If you're talking to a farmer about the problems on the farm, it's not something that you can do in a couple of hours. You have to take time because each farm is different and each farmer has a different need, different requirement, and different things to tell. So that initial six months ended up um, increasing to over a hundred farmers where we sat down, or Sam sat down in front of the Arga at the farm, um, uh, patting the head of the border collie and really getting under the skin of the problems. And what we found was that farmers are not the Luddites that maybe I, as a, as a metropolitan um, um, uh, tech person, would have thought. Farmers are well used to adopting new technology. Some farmers view their farm as 40 experiments uh, that they have to work through over the course of their career. But what farmers are really afraid of is technology failing. They hate the idea of spending a fortune when their margins are so razor thin in developing a new system or working with a new system that might not work. And they just can't afford to be able to buy this machinery uh, to be able to put it in place. So when we found out what farmers want, it really started to help our thinking and really made us go back to the drawing board in terms of the structure of what we we're trying to do. As I said, farmers view the, their um, career on a farm as 40 experiments. They have to be brave and they have the agency to brave. They can do what they want in their fields and they're constantly trying to new technology. But if they try that technology, they are afraid of it breaking. They're also afraid of obsolescence. They're afraid of a piece of technology that they buy for uh, £100,000 this year, uh, only costing them £50,000 and being twice as efficient next year. They're also afraid of machinery that they can't fix and have being stuck with a piece of kit that they've had to buy that they can't do anything about. They can't afford that high level of capital investment. What farmers need is reliability. They need to be able to understand the cost of producing a crop at the end of the year. They need to be able to either maintain or improve the yields that they're providing because they need to generate revenue, but they need to be able to bring down the cost of production. They also need to be able to try stuff out simply and without any barriers. So buying a piece of technology is not an option for them. So we invented farming as a service. The idea that instead of automating a single process on a farm or replacing one piece of drive drivered vehicle uh, with one that's driverless. What they need is something that allows the healthy uh, delivery of a healthy crop at the end of the year and looks after all the processes within that. They need this to be a service, a service that um, is delivered per hectare and charged per hectare and is end to end and incorporates all the components from before the seed goes in the ground right up to the point of harvest. And this needs to include the hardware and the software linked together in an integrated system so that they can um, take advantage of all the um, uh, uh, intelligence that's possible with things like AI and a more detailed understanding of the crop without actually having to go out and monitor and check over each individual ear of wheat themselves. But key to this is that they can't afford to spend the money. So they want a service that allows them to be able to adopt it um, slowly and gradually over time and that updates itself so they don't have the fear of obsolescence. So we formed a small robot company and we formed it with a vision of a service, a service of small, precise robots. And the core of the service is that it understands and cares for each individual crop plant. It provides per plant farming. So to do this, we did away with the idea of, of tractors and the traditional equipment and technology that's um, used today, because that doesn't allow you to deliver the, um, the level of intelligence and data and detail and the capacity to be able to act on it um, that we would need. So once we established that we needed to, to create a service, we knew that we needed to create a suite of capability, a suite of farming experts that were autonomous 
a suite of robots. And so let me introduce you to Tom, Dick and Harry. So Tom is a small robot, lightweight, that lives on the farm and is completely autonomous. He has a home in a sort of a kennel that he can go back to at the end of the day to charge his batteries. And he can spend all day going up and down the field rows, uh, collecting information on the crop plants, the other plants in the field, some might call them weeds, uh, the soil and the environment as a whole. And by collecting this data, six terabytes of data every single day per robot, provide a good source that allows for the intelligence uh, to be converted for the other robots. Tom then passes this information when he goes back to the kennel to Wilma, who's a distributed operating system that lives both on Tom, but also in the kennel and also in the cloud. And Wilma is essentially a data analysis and decision engine. And she converts those six terabytes of images, hyperspectral and normal images into information, and then from that information into intelligence. So that information is presented via a web uh, application and interface for farmers to see so they can understand exactly what's happening in their farm. But then it is converted again into instructions for Dick and Harry. So Dick is a crop care robot and is only sent to the farm as and when necessary. Dick uh, can uh, kill weeds individually by using electricity and can also treat the crop for pests and disease and making sure only to kill the um, pests are where they are and only to treat the plants that have the disease. So massively reducing the chemicals. And finally, Harry is a planting robot that can place the seed accurately and precisely in the ground. So let's look a little bit more at Tom. So Tom is designed to go up and down the fields all day, every day. This is something that can't happen at the moment, because even if you put sensors on tractors, those tractors are massively heavy. And it's not possible or time uh, efficient for, a, for a, a farmer to drive up and down gathering that data as often as we need it. So Tom can scan 200 uh, hectares over the course of two weeks, 20 hectares a day, uh, and will be fully autonomous. By doing that, we get this live, real-time view of the crop as it grows. And we can also see not just where the weeds are, but what type of weeds are or they are. We can also start to understand the health of the soil, and we can start to understand where the pests are. And all this is done um, uh, using uh, very lightweight machinery uh, and an effective AI. So Tom is already in fields with our customers. Um, we have been working with customers for the for this uh, winter wheat season, uh, and we um, will be uh, rolling that out uh, to a larger number of customers next year. So Dick is precise. So Dick is a doing robot uh, and is designed to fit in the back of a van and be delivered to the farm only when necessary. Uh, Dick um, has um, a series of functional booms, which can do all sorts of clever things, um, to, but driven by Tom's data and Wilma's intelligence. Dick can kill weeds individually using electricity and also tell the difference between weeds that are actually threatening the crop plant and weeds which are essentially just meadow flowers that might actually do benefit to the growth of the crop plants. So Dick can um, apply fertilizer just to the plants that need it, kill the weeds using electricity, and use clever systems um, and uh, uh, biological treatments to be able to kill pests. So Dick really is the, the future of crop care for weed. But in many ways, it starts with Harry. Now, the big problem with traditional uh, tractor-based farming is that you need to pull a plow through the soil. And to do that, you need a big, heavy piece of machinery that has a lot of draft force, which is why tractors are so powerful and so heavy. They need to pull that plow. But if you have a planting system that doesn't require plowing, that can be much more lightweight, then you can avoid having a great, big, heavy, powerful vehicle on the field. And if you can take away the requirement to have a driver there, then that vehicle can be even lighter. So Harry is designed to um, require the minimum amount of draft force, individually placing the seed in the ground and making sure it's covered properly so that it can emerge. By doing this, it means the farmer doesn't have to plow and we can plant directly into the stubble of the previous year. So that stops all of the CO2 being released into the air 
um, that um, would uh, happen if we use the plow and allows for the soil structure to be held in place and to sequester carbon up to two tons a hectare a year uh, on its own. But as I mentioned before, the key to all of this, the heart of all of this is Wilma. Wilma is the boss. Wilma is the one that takes that data from uh, Tom and converts it into instructions for Dick and Harry. This uh, AI driven operating system works across our whole system uh, and is particularly useful for farmers so they can understand what is going on in their field and they don't feel that their agency and the capabilities um, of their um, experience are taken away. We have a, a methodology that encourages farmers to engage with us. And in fact, we have over 20 farmers who have invest, uh, who have prepaid for our service. Um, nearly 200 farmers who've expressed an interest in using our capability and nearly 600 farmers who have invested in us. And we are taking advantage of the collective knowledge and intelligence of these farmers, not just to deliver the uh, service upfront, but to engage with that service on an ongoing basis. So, for example, um, Wilma has the capacity not just to show where we think weeds are, but to allow the farmer to go in and see the data, their data that's been collected on their farm, and show us where we maybe got that um, selection of weeds wrong. Uh, maybe we've picked a stone, or maybe we've missed one. We've also engaged with farmers to be able to understand how we need to roll out our service. And that is why our initial focus is on non-chemical weeding and dig. Because ultimately, um, farmers have an existential threat, an existential issue around weeds. The use of uh, chemicals, um, uh, herbicides over the years has forced um, farmers to use fewer and fewer, whether they're banned or whether plants have become um, immune to them and resistant to them. Uh, the number of uh, herbicides that farmers can turn to is getting smaller and smaller. It means also that the herbicides that are less are getting more and more aggressive which has obviously a negative impact on the environment. And what farmers are really suffering from, particularly in the UK and Europe at the moment, is a, a plant called blackgrass, which is almost identical to wheat. But, and in a normal uh, field, in a normal meadow, uh, would um, be outcompeted by the other plants in there. But because the um, herbicides are killing all the other plants, it means that black grass is allowed to grow rampantly and take over large portions of the field. And in some places in the UK, black grass is, is resistant to glyphosate, the farmer's last resort for killing weeds, which means that they either have to give up a piece of land because they can no longer farm it because black grass has taken it over, or it means they have to spend a lot of money in being able to counter the issues uh, that black grass provides. By using Wilma, we have this per plant view of the crop. And through Wilma, we create um, routing algorithms for Dick and Harry to be able to understand where they need to go in the field. This is incredibly powerful because it means that we can be much more circumspect about when we send the robots out. We don't need to rush out with Dick, for example, to kill the weeds in a rush at the start of the season. We can take our time. The good thing about plants is that they don't move. And once Tom tells us where they are, we can take our time killing them only when they need to be killed, or if we need to, leaving them alone. So this per plant farming and um, that Wilma allows us to, to create um, is the hub and the center of our service. But the really interesting thing, and going back to a point I made at the start, is that the systems that have been developed as part of the third agricultural revolution are really focused on Europe, um, uh, Australia, America, developed countries where farmers tend to have large fields and large farms. And that is where the benefits are really derived. There are hundreds of millions of farmers the world over who haven't benefited from the advantages of the third industrial revolution. But by introducing a service, which can work on a per hectare basis, where the farmers don't have to put out a massive initial outlay to be able to afford that machine, but by allowing them to pay as they go, maybe even pay in arrears, then we can bring the potential increase in yield and the potential reduction in chemicals that our service allows to all farms, whether they have a thousand hectares or one. So this can truly be a global change. The fourth agricultural revolution has the chance to have a global impact. 
To put that in context, India is the second largest producer of wheat in the world. The average yield in India is one ton per hectare. In places where per plant farming has been enacted um, in uh, test laboratories in the UK, wheat can produce 20 tons per hectare. If it is possible to bring only a fraction of that potential increase in yields, combined with the regeneration of the soil, the sequestering of the carbon within the soil, uh, and the reduction of inputs such as chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, uh, fungicides, and fertilizer, then we have a chance to hugely increase the world's food production while reducing the amount of land we need to do it and regenerating the land that that is on. Small robot company is not alone. There are hundreds of agritech startups and hundreds of places such as Harper Adams and AgriEpi um, that are encouraging and fostering these new innovations and technologies to be able to deliver a whole new way of farming. Most of these are focused on these goals from the fourth agricultural revolution. These goals of precision and accuracy, and most importantly, sustainability. So with the support of the farmers that we have, the government who's uh, moving in the right direction, and you, we can change farming to a sustainable, profitable, carbon positive benefit to mankind and the world we live on. Thank you very much. If you do have any questions, please do feel free, although I suspect I've just run out of time. But thank you very much for your time, everyone. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for all the lovely comments uh, in the um, chat field. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll hope I have a chance to look at them. Goodbye.